even the concept of like being booked out, being booked and busy, like we slowly start to like link our value to our output and we don't even realize it. And so you get to a point where you can't put out anymore because you're burnt out. And then we start to think that like we're less valuable as people and as business owners. Three, two, one. Welcome to the Campfire Circle. I'm your host, Tanya Bhattacharya, and I empower purpose-driven women in building influential personal brands that drive change and raise revenue. We all talk about getting a seat at the table, but why though? Who wants to sit in a stuffy boardroom anyway? Let's reimagine the ultimate space of leadership as a campfire circle, where we share stories that inspire movements, build brave communities to huddle together with for warmth, and where there is always room. Come sit with us. Tatiana, I am so excited to have you here, and I am not trying to freak you out at all, but like I mentioned to you before, I have been watching you, I have been lurking, and more than anything, I have been learning from you from afar as you have been building your business and dropping gems and knowledge and doing what you do so well. So I'm really grateful for this one-on-one time. Welcome to the Campfire Circle. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. No, absolutely. So So Tatiana, you are a agency and team operations coach, but really what I love and appreciate so much about your work is that you don't just help people create an org chart or you don't just help people create SOPs, right? What you actually help people recover from the grind, right? That those patterns of overwork, perfectionism, over delivery, that anxious, hot feeling of like feeling like we have to do it all ourselves or things are going to fall apart. And that's real right? Because I could Google how to create an SOP, but to really overcome and find recovery from that addiction to the grind, that takes true guidance. So Tatiana, I would love for you to tell me the story of what you have grown through to become the guide that you are today. Yeah, absolutely. So I started myself in the corporate world right after college. I've always been in operations, like even in like, you know, the first jobs that you have, Um, I've always really enjoyed learning and understanding how the business works like on the back end, but I've always enjoyed the people aspect as well. So I studied hospitality management. So kind of looking at operations through the lens of like travel and tourism, thought I wanted to get into the hotel business, thought I wanted to get into restaurants, but I landed in grocery stores. So I was a district manager for Aldi grocery stores uh, for about four, four and a half years. And while I was there, I hired I mean, over a hundred people had to fire quite a few people, led a lot of people through, you know, the stages of being entry-level associates all the way up to being assistant store managers. And when I first came in, I, I think I was really struggling because I thought that because my stores were doing so bad, I thought that what they needed was for me to roll up my sleeves and get in there and like do the work for them. So I had to learn a couple hard lessons about what true leadership is and, you know, micromanaging and taking back responsibility. And so after, you know, getting good at my job, I was able to take my district from one of the bottom performing to one of the top performing. We decreased store turnover by about 30%, which retail turnover is always astronomical. So that was a huge win. And I always knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I left my job actually three years ago. About like three years ago today. <laughs> and wow, happy birthday. Happy <laughs> celebration. That's amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, but I left my job initially to just coach in general. Like I thought I just wanted to coach people on how to start a business because I'd started a couple in my lifetime. So I thought that's what my purpose was. Quickly realized I didn't love it. My heart wasn't in it. And I realized over the course of about six months that what I really wanted to do was help people achieve like true balance in their lives and to be able to step away from the business when they wanted to. And I realized like the dots kind of connected for me that my experience that I gained in corporate was going to be so valuable in the online space because there just aren't a lot of people teaching this kind of stuff and weren't a lot of people who knew it, you know, not, not all of us come from a corporate background or a leadership background. So yeah, just being able to fill that gap and what I do now has been incredible. 
Oh my gosh, a hundred percent. I I really relate to that piece of your story where you were talking about like you thought the best thing to do would be roll up your sleeves and jump into the trenches and try to like fix it all yourself. I think so often that's what we do. You know, we think we're helping, but we're actually enabling, right? We're creating codependent relationships and we're burning ourselves out, right? In the process. And so I don't know if you know this, Tatiana, but before I started my business, I worked in the addiction treatment space. Like that's what I did for 12 years. And and so I was really attracted to your branding and your concept of recovery and recovering from the grind because I relate to it. Because, you know, even though I worked in the recovery field, I never had that allergy to drugs and alcohol. I'm what some people would call a normie, which still makes me laugh. But I deeply understand the addiction to the grind and to overwork and to all of those related things. So can you tell me, like, what are some of the signs and symptoms that you are a grindaholic? Mm -hmm. Well, first, I just want to say, I think a lot of us step into this lifestyle unintentionally because it it just kind of comes with the territory of entrepreneurship, right? We're told that, you know, we have to pull up, you know, do the whole bootstrap thing that we have to grind it out, that we have to hustle, that we have to work really hard. And it's not that those things aren't true, right? There are still going to be seasons, even when you have the best team ever, there are still going to be seasons where you have to quote unquote grind it out, but that shouldn't be your every day, right? And even the concept of like being booked out, being booked and busy, like we slowly start to like link our value to our output and we don't even realize it. And so you get to a point where you can't put out anymore because you're burnt out And then we start to think that like we're less valuable as people and as business owners. So I think some of the signs would be one, truly like always feeling like you have to have a fully booked out roster of clients, always having a wait list. I think we're told that having a wait list is good because it means that, you know, people are, you know, want our services and that we're in demand. But what that tells me is that we're at capacity and that we actually can't serve people and we're having to turn people away. I think some other things would be, and this is something I'm still guilty of that I still work through, but if you find white space on your calendar and you're trying to then fill that white space with something, it's, it may be a sign that we have not yet adjusted to the comfort of having free time, right? We feel like we always have to be operating in this state of chaos. And then I think finally, if you are somebody who already has team members, but you still feel like you're experiencing this a little bit, that might look like not truly delegating what you need help with to your team. Maybe you're just giving them the surface level tasks because that's what's easy and that's what you can you know, trust them to do. When in reality, you need support on a much deeper level, but we don't know how to kind of let go of the reins a little bit. Yes, we are like white knuckling, like holding onto the reins so close, like so tightly because we think that that gives us control, but really... We have no control, right? We get to be, we, I think surrender is the way to go, but it's a strategic surrender when you're talking about, you know, growing your business, you know, and actually that, what that reminds me of, there's a space in which our expertise is kind of come together in this interesting Venn diagram. And that's this piece around figuring out your zone of genius, right? And so in my swim lane of thought leadership, you've got to figure out your zone of genius so you can speak to it externally and embody it internally to become a top of mind expert in that thing. But in your swim lane of building your team and building your leadership capacity, I feel like in the delegation conversation, you've got to figure out your zone of genius so that you can spend your time there and delegate everything else, right? Even even your zone of excellence stuff, eventually, maybe not right away, but eventually you've got to let go. And so can you share with me and our listeners any tips you have for figuring out what your zone of genius is so that you can delegate the other stuff? Yeah, I mean, I would say generally speaking, your zone of genius is most likely in the service that you deliver, right? So if you're a coach, your zone of genius is likely the coaching. If you run some sort of agency, your zone of genius is likely the, you know, the most prominent thing that your agency provides. And so I think a part of like figuring out what to delegate is looking at where do I want to focus my time? Where do I want to show up every day in my business? And then what are all of the tasks surrounding that, right? So how can I get all of these other things out of my plate so that I can focus on being in that zone? In your zone of genius, I also think kind of changes and refines as you grow older in your business. So right now you may say, "Mm, I'm actually really enjoying what I'm doing. I don't really want to delegate that part. I just want someone to help me on the other things. 
But then later in life, you may find that you don't even want to do the the main thing that your business does. Maybe you want to hire a team of people to deliver that service for you so that you can then focus on starting another, you know, segment to the business or, or what have you. So I would say finding your zone of genius is probably going to be looking at that thing that you started the business to do, right? The thing that you love doing day in and day out, the thing that brings you joy, that doesn't feel draining and depleting to you. But then also just keeping an eye on that as you grow in your business, because it could change and evolve. And some of the discomfort that we feel may be us not realizing that we're in a place where we no longer want to be within our businesses. Right. And not feeling any guilt about that. Right. Because I think sometimes we think of our business as a little bit of our baby and it's like, you know, you can you can let go. Your baby gets to grow up and it gets to go into the next. It gets to become an adolescent and then a teenager and it will look different in all of those phases and spaces. Yeah. Yeah. I love So I, you know, like I said, I've been creeping on you, watching your stuff. And one of the exercises you put out there that really helped me was kind of like that grid. It's like, a, mm-hmm. do you know what I'm talking about? It's like a four yeah. square grid. Can you talk about that? Yes. T- t- tell us about that. Cause that really helped me. Yeah, absolutely. So it can be a little challenging if you, if you're not visualizing it, but you can grab it on my website at tatianaohara.co slash task matrix. So you can visually see it. But it's essentially a four quadrant document. It's if you've seen an Eisenhower matrix, it's it's a version of an Eisenhower matrix. And basically what you do is you're going to brain dump all of the things that you're doing day to day in your business. And you're going to categorize it into one of the four quadrants, each of your tasks. And so the four quadrants are basically, you know, the things that you like doing that you're really good at, the things that you like doing that you're not good at, the things that you don't like doing that you're good at, and the things that you hate and you're also really bad at, right? And so once you kind of fill this in, it gives you a really nice visual, a bird's eye view of where you're proportionately spending your time within the business. Like, am I mostly spending my time on things that I'm not good at? Am I mostly spending my time on things that I don't like doing? And then that can kind of give you your initial framework for who you should hire and what you should actually have them do. And the reason why I wanted to create this freebie, I've had this freebie for three years now. The reason why I wanted to create this was because... So many people, whenever they're ready to hire their first person, 10 times out of 10, they want to hire a VA. And that's great. But sometimes through this exercise, you may find that a VA might actually not be the best first hire for you. Maybe where you really need support is in your marketing or in your sales or in your back end systems, whatever the case is. But, you know, the follow up to that is whether it's the VA, the social media person, whatever, the task matrix is going to give you like, a blueprint of what to actually delegate to them because it's all written down for you, right? So instead of just hiring this person and then you're kind of staring at each other like, so how are you going to help me? What are you going to (laughs) do? We can give them like an exact blueprint and it just makes the the working relationship so much more intentional and it's going to help you get a a faster ROI on the relationship. Yes. Yes. It sounds so simple, but once you see the brain dump written out and you can start grouping things together and be like, holy smokes, I can just type this out and have it. This is, this can just be my orientation. This is like a checklist for what I want my person to do. And life is good. Just simplifies it. I love it. And you know, so as I did that, there were some things that showed up in the squares where it's like, I didn't necessarily love doing that, but well, I guess what I'm trying to say is I feel like there are some things and maybe you feel free to disagree with me. But I feel like there are some things that maybe you just can't delegate. And one of those things is visibility, right? And so I have seen you go from like one, more of a one-on-one offering to now an amazing group coaching program where you're helping hundreds of people recover from the grind. And I would guess that that requires being ready to command a bigger stage, right? Or stoke a larger campfire circle. So I'd love for you just to tell me about your thought leadership strategy, your visibility strategy, right? Mm-hmm. How are you showing up for the audience who who is looking for you? Yeah, that's a really good question because it's I think it's constantly changing because the brand is evolving. So when I first started, you know, everything was very much tied to me and what I do and you know, my results, but I'm in 2023 really working on separating the two brands so that Grindaholics Anonymous, my program can kind of live on its own. And then my personal brand can evolve into, yes, team stuff and business stuff, but also like what my life looks like because of the team that I have, right? So now the way our our visibility strategy is kind of, I guess, pivoting 
is we're very, very heavy on highlighting our clients because I can tell you the program is great till I'm blue in the face, but I want you to see it from my clients. So a couple times a month, we try to go live with our clients to you know showcase them, showcase their results. We made a commitment about six or seven months ago to stop just sharing screenshots of wins because I don't think that shows the full picture. And now we create full page case studies on all of our clients. So when you go to our website, you're able to read you know dozens of case studies of our clients' results. I've also incorporated my team into my strategy a lot too. So if I'm going to be preaching team, 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 I want you to see mine, right? And so my team makes reels sometimes. I go live with my team members from time to time. And even, you know, earlier you were saying, you know, you can't really delegate the visibility part. I totally agree as far as like the face, right? If, if you're going to be the face, you're going to be the face. But my team has positioned me to be able to delegate so many elements of visibility, right? So like being able to coordinate things like this lovely podcast interview or creating the outline for the content so that I'm simply just showing up to fill it in, creating a list of live topics. So I don't have to think about what I'm going to go live about. It's already kind of decided for me. And then I can just wing it from there, mapping out a full launch campaign so that I can show up fully in my launch and be able to be present and connect with my, with my audience versus having to be the thought behind it as well. So uh, that was kind of a two-part answer, but that's a little bit of our strategy is like sharing holistically the whole brand, everything that's happening behind the scenes, but then also like incorporating my team into a lot of the the how so that it can take some of the weight off of me and that when I do show up, I can show up more fully versus like the half tire version of me who just mapped out content for a month and had to show up and deliver it. Exactly. You've got so much more white space in your brain to be able to really, to really pull from that authentic place of knowing and show up in the way that you want to. That is so good. You gave some really, really great examples of how you can lean on your team to support your visibility strategy. And I love that. And actually now this is coming back to me. You recently got married. Congratulations. Your wedding and your honeymoon was just beautiful, beautiful to watch. Congratulations. You and your husband are definitely a power couple. But as you were traveling, I'm remembering now your team took over your visibility and, you know, posted all kinds of fun things about them. How did that idea like emerge for you? Was it a natural idea? Did that come up in a, in a team meeting? Because I've never seen somebody who does like what we do do that before. Yeah. I loved it. I mean, it, it kind of worked out perfect. So I have a team of about seven people, if you count all of the like extended contractors that I work with here and there, but my core team, the people I work with every day, there's three of them. So I have my tech VA who also does like our client relations stuff. I have my operations manager and then I have my marketing coordinator and I was going to be out for three weeks. So I'm like, okay, I have three team members. I'm out for three weeks. Like what if I just have them do a team takeover? They each get their own week. And so the way that we did it was on the Monday of the week, whoever's week it was, let's say it's Brianna, my marketing coordinator, Brianna would make a post and she would give out some like tips on team thing, uh, like a team related topic. And then throughout the entire week, she's just kind of driving some of those points home and creating more educational content around it. But then also a big pillar of my brand is a sense of humor. So they made some funny reels, you know, some, some dancing reels, things I, w- I would never do. <laughs> um, but it, it was really nice. And people like really, really enjoyed it. I think I was afraid that like, oh man, engagement's going to tank because I'm not here. But no, like people really enjoy like hearing from my team members. And I think that even creates more buy-in around my brand because people are seeing that like, I practice what I preach. Like I really do delegate to my team. I trust them fully. And I don't, you know, I'm not going to cease all operations just because I'm out for three weeks. Like I want to show you that this is a machine that is going to keep running, even though, you know, I'm off in Mexico on my honeymoon. A hundred, a thousand percent. And you know, what's coming up for me now is as we grow in our businesses, Something that happens, I'm not there yet, right? But something that happens is as we grow our team, grow our businesses, we, of course, are always trying to attract the right clients and the right, you know, people who are looking for our services. But at a certain point, it also switches to being able to attract the right talent, being able to attract the right team. And it seems like what you're doing is really showcasing the culture behind your brand and it makes people want to work for you. Like, have you noticed a difference in how your job applications are coming in and how people are raising their hand and saying, like, hire me? Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, we just had our team retreat not too long ago, right after our client retreat, our annual client retreat. 
And I had quite a few people reaching out like, hey, are you hiring? Are you looking for anybody? And if nothing else, I just want to be an example to other people that just because you're running a virtual business and you have virtual team members, it doesn't mean that you can't create this incredible company culture that maybe you've personally never experienced. And I think that was a big thing for me. I've, I've come from a lot of toxic work environments, uh, which is ultimately why I left you know, the corporate world. And I knew that in my business, I wanted to be able to create something that I had never seen before. I wanted to be able to give very generous you know, amounts of paid time off. I wanted to be able to offer very competitive salaries. I wanted them to have very flexible you know, day-to-day schedule. So pretty much everyone on my team has kids, right? And so if, if you tell me that something's going on with your kid and you need the rest of the day, I, I really don't care, you know, like go, go for it. Take care of your family. Family comes first, but I know that I can trust them still. I can assign a group of tasks, projects, whatever, and it's not only going to get done, they're going to go above and beyond. And so, yeah, I think the fun that you see on social media is only a part of it. But I think we're able to have that fun and it's genuine. It comes across as genuine from my team members because they truly love the environment that they work in. They've, they've I have two full-time employees and they've both told me this is the best job they've ever had. And like, that's the best compliment anybody could ever give me because like, that's all I want to do. And when you are thinking about starting to build your team, it's like, it feels scary. It feels like I'm responsible for people's, you know, livelihood. I'm taking on a whole new level in my business. I don't know if I'm ready for this. But on the other side of that, when you release all of the negative of the what if, what if, what if, and you step into the positive of like, what could happen, you know, on the other end of things, like you really just get access to a level of support that you just, you didn't even know was possible. I could go on and on and on about it, but having incredible clients and getting client results has been I think an obvious benefit of being a business owner, but being able to create the best job people have ever had, like that just, it it takes owning a business to a new level. Hey, if anything you're hearing today inspires you to get more visible as a go-to trusted voice for your audience and drive change towards your deeper mission, I've got something for you. LinkedIn is my favorite place to share my stories and build relationships with my co-conspirators and brand new friends. So I put together a free resource with 14 prompts to create your next post on LinkedIn. Take all the guesswork out of what to say and just start building your impact and influence. Be sure to tag me in your post so I can come by, cheer you on and amplify your message. You can find those free prompts in the show notes. Okay, back to the episode. You know, I have so much I want to ask you about that because there's, you know, there's this phrase I often say on various episodes of this podcast around like, it's really hard to be what you can't see. And so when you haven't had examples of, you know, corporate cultures or working cultures that felt good, in fact, they felt very much the opposite. They felt very toxic. They, you know, oftentimes are the reason that we left and started our own businesses. Do you have any tips or suggestions or thoughts for folks on how they can create something they haven't experience themselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I actually use the phrase a lot, you know, let your past be your power, right? So Mm -hmm. I personally am doing that. I'm creating something that I haven't seen before. And the way that I'm able to do that is instead of like trying to put my blinders on and just pretend, you know, these years of my life in corporate never happened, I'm digging really deep on those experiences. And I'm like thinking thoroughly about how I felt in certain situations when I did feel empowered, when I did not feel empowered, and I'm using that to inform the way that I build my new culture, right? So for example, you know, my job was very flexible. You could kind of come and go as you please. Towards the end, I got really, really good at my job. Like I could be out of there by three o'clock every day. Whereas some of my peers were staying until five thirty, six o'clock. And so when your leader sees that you're leaving at three, you know, they're scrutinizing you and they're coming to your stores all the time. And micromanaging. And basically you would think that it's a reward because her stores look so great. Her managers are doing so well that she doesn't have to pull 50 hour weeks anymore. But instead it was like something to put me under a microscope. And so again, I flip that and I say, okay, well in my business, I want to reward people for being able to get off by three o'clock. Like I want to reward them for being so productive and so efficient in the work that they do that they get to experience more of their personal lives. Right. 
And so I did that by creating a really flexible working schedule for my team members. Or I guess another example would be our bonus structure, right? Like I wanted people to feel like they had a piece of the pie and not just, you know, they just work here, right? You know, the company makes more money and they make the same amount. And so that's when, you know, kind of we're not done with it, but fleshing out our bonus structure kind of came into play. So I guess what I'm saying here is you have to take the experiences that you did have and ask yourself, do I want to duplicate this? If not, how would I want to feel now? If I could go back in time and take this job again, how would I have wanted to feel? And then the second part is ask your team members, right? So when you're going through the hiring process, ask them to map out their dream job for you. What is your dream company culture? And then you as the leader get to decide, how do I want to incorporate this into you know, the culture that we're building? Mm. Mm. That was such a masterclass. That was so good, you know, and that's so aligned with what I believe in in terms of your story and your lived experience contains the pieces that you need, right? There's this quote I love by Brene Brown, one day you'll tell the story of what you overcame and it will become someone else's survival guide. I see that coming to fruition here, not so much in terms of like telling the story, but using the story Um, to actually inform the way that you're running your business and creating your culture. I just, mm -hmm. I love that so much. I think we kind of run away from our old experiences because it was so bad or traumatic for us. But what we don't realize is like, that is our most powerful tool in building the right thing because you literally have the blueprint of what not to do. So don't run away from that experience, run into it, right? And now you're on the outside of it so you can dissect it for what it was and figure out how you want it to be different. Yes, cozy up to it, right? Cuddle with it so that you can get all of those pieces. Yes, I think that is so good. That is so good. I want to go back to something that you mentioned in terms of your visibility strategy, which is the case studies. You have great case studies on your website, you know, all, all over. Can you tell me a little bit about your process of how you go about asking folks to participate in those case studies? You know, how do you, you know, maybe how do you select the people that you want to ask? How do you go about asking them? Is there an audit, like an, a piece of your process to make it easy for your team? Spill the gems on that. Yeah, absolutely. So we have like a survey process in place within the business. So people take a survey when they first join the program, when they're halfway through, and then as they graduate. And so when they graduate, basically they take the survey and then they can book a graduation call. So on this graduation call, we spend some time just recapping their time in the program. And then I just want to make sure that they feel set up for the future. So like if you don't plan to renew, which most of our clients do renew and stay for another six months, but if you don't plan to renew, then how can I basically set you up, right? Like what, what do we need to talk through? And so while I'm on this graduation call, I go through the case study form with them. And so they already know that, that we're going to be doing it. And it's a short like document, like template that we fill in. So, you know, I'm asking how many team members did you have before? How many do you have now? You know, talk me through some of the problems you had before the program. Talk me through the solution that Grindaholics provided. Talk to me about the results you've experienced since graduating. And so I just kind of fill in this template and it's a, it's a Google doc. So it's not, you know, perfect. It's not in paragraph format. It's kind of bullet point form, but the graduation call is also recorded So I then send the recording and the document to my marketing coordinator and she makes it into a a really pretty document. She pulls out like a main quote to kind of be like the the header or the focus of that case study. And then she publishes it on the website, makes it super pretty. And then we send it to the client once it's done so they can check it out. And then it goes live on our website. You know, when you say it, it's like, of course, that's so simple. But, you know, I think half the battle is, and you know this, is being so overwhelmed that we don't even have time to put the process in place, right? And so, you know, speaking of process, you know, if you know me, you know I love a good framework. And so do you have a specific framework that you use to guide your clients from the place where they'd be so overwhelmed they can't even, like, put that, you know, case study process in place to the to a place where it's delegated, it's good to go, and it's just happening? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to try to talk through it very quick because it can be a lot. (laughs) But our process is called the RECOVER method. So it's a seven-step process. Uh, RECOVER is an acronym. And so the R, the first R, stands for reconstruct and detox. So that's when you are detoxing your mindset from the grind, kind of leaving what you thought you had to do to be successful behind, really creating the vision that you have for your life and for your business. And then E is examining your offers. So here we're looking at 
the structure of the services that you deliver, making sure that they're as efficient and streamlined as possible, looking at your prices, looking at your processes, because you can't really build a team on something that can't grow past wherever you currently are, right? Then next is the C, which is charting the organization. So that's creating your org chart. We're going to map out every person you need on the team to make the vision come into fruition. Because a lot of times we are just hiring impulsively, like we're hiring based on what we need right now. And then two years later, you look up and you have a very expensive team that's not helping you get to the end goal. So that's the C. So REC, then the O in recover is organizing your hires. That's teaching you our thorough, phenomenal hiring process. Then the V is validating your onboarding needs. So here we're mapping out your onboarding process to make sure that when your team members come in, they feel supported and like it's matching exactly what you told them they'd get, you know, in the in the interview process. We're also talking about training. We teach you our proprietary training plan method, which will help your team members get to 100% in 90 days. Then E, the, the final E is engaging your team. And that's really where we're just teaching you day-to-day leadership. That's where we're teaching you how to have effective meetings, how to have, you know, really good conversations, tough conversations, how to basically just help your team members flourish and the day-to-day actions to make that happen. And then finally, the last R of the recover method is relapse avoidance. So I think this is probably the most important part of the framework because a lot of programs, frameworks are going to teach you how to get the result. But then sometimes once you leave the program, you feel like you're reverting back to your old ways or like you forget how to function in the real world. And so relapse avoidance is all about what do I do when I feel like I want to start micromanaging again? What do I do when I want to fire my whole team because I'm scared and I just want to start doing it all by myself again? And so really teaching you the habits of how to get into the CEO seat, but also how to stay there. So the recover method is seven steps and it's, it's lengthy. It's not your average, you know, three step framework because this is a all around lifestyle change, right? Like we're completely changing the way that you do business. We're taking your focus away from the marketing and the sales and putting it inward towards how do I actually want to run my business? So that's our framework. Oh my goodness. This is like, a, this is like uh, a new version of the 12 steps of recovery, but it only takes seven. I think seven is, you know, can I just say marketing and communications professionals say all the time, like be clear and not cute, but you are both clear. You are cute. You are creative. You are charming. I'm trying to think of another C word. You're just, I'm like, I'm just obsessed with you. And can I say how important coming from the addiction treatment field, right? This is what I did professionally before. The fact that you have relapse prevention or relapse avoidance in your program is so key because that this is a chronic ailment, you know, just like actual addiction. Like it, I don't even want to say just like actual addiction. Overworking is a very real way that we like try to plug up that hole in our soul that causes those addictive behaviors, you know, so this is real. And so mm, that's just so good. I could talk to you all day, but just to kind of wrap us up for this episode, I have a final question for you and it's kind of a big one. So feel free to expand into it. But I would love to know, Tatiana, what is your big dreamy vision for the community that you serve? Like what kind of future do you see for them as you help your community recover from grindaholism? That is a big question. I see a lot. I I really want to support the brand in evolving past just team building. Because I think on the outside, when you're just looking at it online, it can seem like, oh, hiring. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to her when I need to hire. But more than anything, I just want to show people, business owners, that you don't have to choose between being a successful business owner and being a wife or being a mom or being a present friend, daughter, sister, whatever. And so I just I want to expand the brand into helping people have access to whatever lifestyle they want without having to compromise the success of their company. So I think that's the short version of it. But it goes so much deeper. We want to expand into government and corporate mm-hmm. opportunities as well. That's something we're working on next year. But yeah. That's huge. That's huge. Because I think that, not I think that, like, you know, we've all been talking about the great resignation for years now. And, you know, I, we've seen it. We see so many people 
leaving their corporate jobs because they are overworked and they're burnt out. But then they, but then what happens is they recreate that hamster wheel so often. And it's not about shaming anybody for that. It's like, that's just human nature. We recreate what we know. And so for you to expand your vision and help folks in all different sectors, not just online business owners, like, I love it. I love it. It's so needed. So where can folks that are listening to this, where can they find you? How can they get in touch with you? You know, if they're motivated to, into taking action, what's their next step? Yeah, absolutely. So I am on Instagram way more than I should be. So you can follow me on Instagram at underscore Tatiana O'Hara. You can also follow our company page at Grindaholics Anonymous. And there I share a lot of good things. I go live often. There's, you could go on my page now and binge for probably five days of all the lives and different you know types of content that we post. But then if you wanted to take it a step further, we have our program, Grindaholics Anonymous. It's a six-month experience for the business owner who's ready to build a sustainable, profitable team and really escape from the grind you know, for good. So you can learn more about that on my social media handles as well. Love that. Love that. Well, as you know, as I've said a couple times now, I love following you. It's not only educational and like informational, but it is freaking fun. You make me laugh all the time <laughs> and it's, it's a ride. Thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. I've loved this conversation. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. What'd you think? Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or even better, reach out and let me know through lumosmarketing.co. Yes, that's Lumos as in the illumination spell from Harry Potter. Because when you shine, magical things happen. You can get social with me on LinkedIn. And of course, check out the show notes to stay in touch with our guests. Let's talk soon.